Good morning. How are we doing? I'm here. That's good. It's a start. Oh, I, I feel relieved by that song and that prayer. I came here with nothing and all you have given me. Make new wine out of me. So, we're just going to jump right into chapter 9. If you've got your scripture pages out or the blank notes, I didn't give you a fancy outline. Um, but as I look, and, and I want to keep reminding us, I hope that you are looking backwards, even as we move into new chapters, that you're seeing this whole story, the whole tapestry, the whole symphony, however you wanted to think of this book of Matthew, that when we chunk it down too far, we miss it. And so go backwards and, and go back. And how does, this, how does this apply? How does this continue what he was telling me in the very first chapter, in the Sermon on the Mount, in the encounters that we've seen with Jesus so far? The thing that is striking me over and over is the responses people are having to Jesus. And all of these different individuals or groups, how when they have an encounter with Jesus, they get to choose their response. And I'm seeing myself in them. And I'm seeing myself sometimes in ones that I would prefer not to see myself in that encounter. Um, and it's it, it is. It's making new wine out of me. It's cleansing my spirit. It's reminding me, he is reminding me that he wants to do a new thing. So in this first little chunk in chapter 9, we're looking at the story of Jesus healing the para hmm, paralytic. See, I, I underlined the live because I wanted to say that correctly, and I still wanted to go back to how I've said it in my past was paralytic. No, paralytic. I don't know what I used to say, but I can't ever say it correctly. Paralysis. Paralytic. Yeah? Paralytic. Okay, it's not so hard if you just say it, but if you think about it first, it's really hard to say. Okay. Um, so as Jesus encounters this man, we get to see that some people brought the man to Jesus. And I don't know for sure if this is the same story of the, the people who lowered the man through the roof. Um, but we've seen this in scripture where the faith of close friends draws people to Jesus. That's Omar, right? And that's so many times, even if it's not a salvation story, I need to be brought to Jesus by you, I need, to be, I need to have people in my life who are close enough to see my hurt and my paralysis. Sometimes I get so stuck in whatever is going on in or around me that I can't even get there, right? And to have friends that see me well enough to say, I'm going to take you there, and I'm going to trust that Jesus is going to do something big for you. And it doesn't ever say anything about this man's faith. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, take heart. And what does he do first? He forgives his sins. And you probably talked about this in your small groups, but that Jesus' heart was always about the eternal. It struck me as we were in chapter 8 last week, I love, love, love the story about the disciples in the boat and the storm comes up and they panic and freak out and Jesus is asleep. He is not undone by our tragic moments, right? And they, they say, wake up, we're perishing. We're gonna die. And his response is, why are you so afraid? And I've always taken that as like, why are you so afraid? I'm right here in the boat. You've seen me do great things. Like clearly I can clean this up for you. But this time, it took on an eternal meaning to me. And I'm, I'm seeing that in Jesus over and over, where it, we know that his teaching was about our hearts and about his eternal kingdom. But what if he was saying to them, yeah, you're perishing. Why are you so afraid of that? 
when you perish, you get to enter the eternal, right? We're, we're in a season where everybody's up in a panic about how we're going to die of COVID. Yeah? Why are you so afraid? We're going to die. News flash, right? We're, we're not going to be here forever. Why are you so afraid? And I love the way Jesus is, is drawing my attention back to his face and back to the things that are eternal. So the fact that he forgives the sins first is paramount in this moment because he is showing this man, his friends, all the people watching, including these snarky scribes on the edges, he's showing them, this is what I care about, is the eternal in your heart. But also, by the way, I, I see what you're saying in your heart. Why are you thinking those evil thoughts? I see what you're thinking. And just so that you will also get to see how powerful I am, I'll, I'll have him get up and walk too. Does that help you? Like, would, would that help you trust me if I show you something physical in this moment too? Because what I really want is for you to trust me. So I've already forgiven his sins, not by his own faith, but by the faith of the people who brought him to me. But just so that you will see, will you see if I get him to get up and walk out of here too, would that help you? And when I see Jesus seeing my heart and not hating it, seeing my heart and the filth that's there and loving it and sweetly drawing me into what he wants to teach me and what he wants to show me, that feels really big. So we get to see the juxtaposition here of the faith of the friends and the, the disbelief and the judgment and the cynicism and critical thinking of the scribes. And unfortunately, I often find myself, I should say it this way, in, in my faith experience, I have often found myself uh, in the story of the scribes, where I can, I can say a lot of right things. I've been in the church my entire life. I know how to respond to people. I know how to respond to situations. I know how to stand in a room full of people and smile. I know how to, in my head, say, that's a load of crap. <laughs> I know how to think in my heart, this man is surely blaspheming. Oh, you look lovely too. Thank you. Go about my sweet churchy self and in my heart be thinking evil about what has just taken place or what I'm witnessing. Lisa made it really a great illustration for us this morning in our small group, but that, to have that question of Jesus, why, why do you think evil in your heart? Where I can let that grab me when I'm at a stoplight and some idiot runs that stoplight, stupid idiot, jerk. Why do I think evil in my heart toward that person Jesus loves? They were wrong, absolutely. Absolutely. Why do I have to think evil in my heart about it? Where does that come from? Lord, come and, and find me there and dig that out of me because that's not you. That's not how you respond to people that you love and created. So to have this question come at me, not in a, there you are, Stephanie. You're thinking evil in your heart again. It's not who I made you to be. Snap out of it. Right? But why, why do you think evil in your heart? Let's, let's sit with that for a second. Where is that coming from? Because that's not, that's not from me. And then we get to see the word authority. And this is something that I don't have anything to teach today, but I just wanted to say out loud that this is something that I am going to be spending more time with as we go through. I've noticed already that in chapter 10, it talks about the authority, and now not only the authority given to Jesus, but he's giving it to his disciples to go out and to teach. And so what, what, is, what is with that? The, the definition I looked up is that it's the power to act. And that power comes from God. As you look at the word authority throughout Scripture, most of the times that it's used in the Old Testament are about kings. 
um, and their authority that they had. But then as we get into the New Testament, it is, it is most often used describing Jesus and the authority that God gave to Jesus to act on earth. Um, and so that power to act out of his presence, out of his existence, out of I am, that's how he gets his authority because he is I am. So when he showed his authority, they were afraid and they glorified God. What's my response? What is the mirror for me as I look at this? How, how am I responding to Jesus? That next slide is James chapter 1 that it says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and right away forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, I love this phrase, write this down, the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. This mirror for me has been a bit painful. Like I said, I don't, you know, you hear a story, maybe it's a Disney story, and who do you want to resonate with? The princess, not the evil queen, right? <laughs> and so that I'm finding myself more in the scribes and Pharisees is is uncomfortable to me. I don't want to sit there for very long. But if I sit there and let Jesus' questions penetrate my heart, then he gets to undo what is there and turn it into new wine, turn it into something beautiful, right? He wants to continue to purify me. And so I don't want to forget when I read this and just walk away and say, yeah, I'm fine. I believe. I'm not a Pharisee. Sometimes, sometimes I do have to argue with the deceiver who wants me to stay a Pharisee, right? And so he wants to bog me down with what a Pharisee I am, and I can just get stuck there. And that's not the point either, right? Because I, I am released from that. I have the law of liberty. There is freedom in this experience of getting to have, have him show me who I am and also liberate me from myself and from the sin that I can get caught up in. Uh, so kind of continuing the theme for me, but moving into a, the next section in verses 9 through 13, um, he's talking about he gets to call Matthew into his followers. And that is just sweet to think about Matthew telling us this story and kind of just subtly inserting his conversion into it. It, he didn't make it with a lot of exclamation points or a massive um, event. He just, he was walking past and he said, hey, follow me, and he, and he did it. And he just got up and went. Um, but the impact of that for Matthew and for us is eternal, right? It's huge. It's unbelievable. Um, so we don't want to miss that moment. But then what we go into is this picture of Jesus getting to experience intimacy with all of these filthy people who were not acceptable in the religious society. And the Pharisees are ticked. And it says in verse 11, and when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, I totally relate. The Pharisees are always looking for something to wrestle with. Oh, I see this. Look what he's doing now, you guys. We have all of this dirt on him already. And now, he, do you, did you see who he's having dinner with? Do you know what she did last night? Oh my gosh, she's sitting right next, she just touched his hand. Right? And they're freaking out because he's with all of these filthy people. And when they saw this, they had something. And they can go after him on that. I have been a snarky Christian. I had a really sweet faith as a little girl. I grew up 
trusting Jesus and knowing that he was my savior. And I, I struggled a lot with fears as a child, but I was a very compliant child. I hated being bad. I hated being wrong. I hated feeling guilty. I had the most overworked guilty conscience a child should ever have. And I just wanted to do the right thing. And I loved Jesus and I knew he loved me. And that lasted into my teenage years and through high school. And then I became an adult and life started to get difficult. Not that I didn't have any difficulties in my childhood, but I just had a, a sweet, rather easy faith. Um, and it wasn't until I had some pretty significant disappointments in my early adulthood that I started to go, well, I don't like this very much. I thought that if I behaved a certain way and loved Jesus, that I would have a pretty great life. Like, isn't that kind of the point? Why would I want to follow you if it's going to be hard? Why would I want to live this if there's not actually any benefit to me? This feels dumb. My expectations of who he was going to be were disappointed. And I love what Amy shared with us back in chapter one about trusting that sometimes Jesus, God, the Father, might not meet our expectations, but he is always about meeting our needs, right? Well, I didn't understand that in my early 20s, and I, something shifted in my faith where I was disappointed. Well-meaning, godly people were affirming to me that I wasn't getting what I deserved, and that, oh, it, things will happen for you someday. Like, it'll, you'll get, you deserve, you deserve it. I mean, you're such a lovely person. And I would put that one in my backpack and carry it with me. Yep, I know, I deserve, I deserve better than what I'm getting. And so I built a little case for myself where this wasn't going as great as I had hoped. And so I'm just gonna kind of do it my way for a little while. And it, my life didn't look rebellious. I still very much loved Jesus. I still very much was involved in church and godly things and with godly people. I just, there was a shift in my mind and heart that said, I'm, I'm just not going to trust you fully because I get hurt when I trust you fully. And, and that feels too hard to step into again. So I think I'm going to just kind of do my life and bring you along if that's all right. Does that sound good? Okay, so that was going to be our deal. And I allowed myself to get caught up in kind of a cynical, snarky attitude. And I liked it. I liked being a snarky Christian. Because you know what? We're super relatable to non-Christians. And I thought that's exactly what God wants me to be. Nobody, nobody buys somebody who's like holy all the time and just talks about how wonderful Jesus is and how great, it, you know, all the things like the churchy answers that really irked me. Nobody wants to be around that kind of person, I thought. And the Lord allowed some more difficulty into my life. And it wasn't until things got much harder that I realized this isn't working. This like, I trust Jesus, but I don't actually want to rely on him. It doesn't work. And so I have spent now a number of years learning how to not be a snarky Christian, how to be one of those Christians that I despised for a little while, that, that it can, like every moment actually can be about what God is doing in my life. And it can be about eternal perspective all the time. And that answer is actually not a churchy, trite response. It's truth. And I don't have to be annoying to someone who can't receive that yet, but I can still be a godly, humble person in their presence without being a snarky, yeah, isn't this dumb? Should we get out of here? Kind of a response. Um, and so as I looked at the scribes and the Pharisees in these encounters with Jesus, that part of my, of my life and my faith story really was in my face. And I, I feel really thankful that the Lord has been so, so patient 
with me. He allowed all of my questions, all of my heretical thoughts to be things that drew me back to himself. He doesn't say, stop asking those questions, just trust me. He says, come to me with your questions. When he met Nicodemus, Nicodemus needed to do it at night, and Jesus didn't say, nope, if you won't see me in the broad daylight and confront your pals, then this isn't happening. He said, yeah, I'll be there. What's your question? I want your heart. Right? And so I spent too many years beating against Jesus' chest, but he knew that that was what I needed and what, what was going to be part of my story to shape my faith. I don't know. I don't want to condone like the, but I do think that that was his sweet kindness to me um, and his faithfulness to me was that he allowed me to take my process. He's such a gentleman. Have you noticed that about Jesus? He's such a gentleman. He's not going to force his way in to a situation that he's not invited to. And we can only invite him into our own. We don't get to invite him into someone else's space. I've said that to my children recently. I, I want to just pray this over you and let it be true to penetrate into your heart. But he's too much of a gentleman to allow me to do that. You're going to have to ask him to do it for you. Because he won't do it just by my asking. Okay. The next little thing that struck me was the, in verse 19, where he, verse 13, 9, 13, where he says, go and learn what this means to the Pharisees. And he refers to Hosea 6, 6. Um, let's take a look at Hosea chapter 6. I looked at the whole thing. If you've looked in the back of your notebook, you've hopefully seen um, the remez part that Holly and... Um, Kelly prepared for us, that where there's so many places where Jesus refers to an Old Testament scripture, and he just does a snippet of it, but it would have called to mind for those people, especially the scribes and the Pharisees, you guys, it would have called to mind a much larger chunk of scripture that they would have known or even memorized. And so when he goes to Hosea 6.6, 6, he just quotes one little part, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, but he says, go and learn what this means. And so this is the whole chapter. They, it says, come, this is the Israelites talking, come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us. What is this sounding like? Holy cow. That we may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord let us press on to acknowledge him as surely as the sun rises. And did you catch that? What Amy said two weeks ago, that even the heavens declare the sun rising from the east to the west, drawing us back home. Even as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. Keep going. What can I do? And then, and then God is talking. What can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. Therefore, I cut you in pieces with my prophets. I killed you with the words of my mouth. Then my judgments go forth like the sun. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. So this is, uh, in, in the book of Hosea, this is the people acknowledging that they need to repent and then not doing it. And so if you go further into chapter 7, they actually turn away and there's a whole bunch of repercussions about that. But it's also a major foreshadowing of Jesus and how he's going to cover our sin, right? And the rebellion of his people. And so it, it again, makes me so much more aware. I think I always thought that Jesus' goal with the Pharisees was just to shut them down and to just kind of rebuke them. And I'm learning this time around how much he was trying to get to their hearts and to say, you, you know this, but there's stuff going on here that has to be dealt with in order for you to understand this picture. And I would love for you to understand, but I actually also know that some of you aren't going to because you're going to get so stuck here. And so I am going to open this up to other people because it's for the whole world, and I'm not going to let it die with you. 
but I really would love for your heart to get drawn into it too. There's a ton here, and I just am going to skim over the next little section. Um, but again, those encounters with Jesus, um, such a big deal. Taking a look at how people respond or responded, and, and where do I see myself in that. Um, but then that last section in verses 35 and 36, just again acknowledging that the goal of Jesus while he was on earth was to teach and proclaim the gospel of the kingdom first. That is his priority. His priority will always, always, always be eternal. And so we wonder and struggle with, why did he heal so many people then and he's not healing whoever it is in my life from physical ailments, right? His priority will always, always, always be eternal in our hearts. He cares so much about our physical his goal and priority will always, always, always be the eternal. And so keeping in mind that that is his focus and that he does have compassion and that's why he does miraculously heal because he has compassion, but he also can see the bigger picture that we don't always get to see. And then the last thing that he says to his disciples, he says to pray for the harvest because the laborers are few. And if you look at the very next bit in chapter 10, I have to chuckle a little bit because it's kind of a, be careful what you pray for because the very next thing he does is send these disciples that he's asking to pray for this to happen out to be the laborers, right? And so when we pray, Lord, we want people to know you. We want your word to go forth. Be aware that that's actually, you might be praying for him to send you, even though you don't know that he's going to. Father, thank you for your word and that it is true and that it is a mirror to our hearts and that it, it shows us, it releases us into the law of liberty, that you want to free us from the gunk that binds us and the sin that gets us tangled up in our own self. Help us to see you, your face, what is eternal. Help us to walk into this world ready to declare your truth and to do it in a way that is loving and kind. Father, help us to see the need of those around us the way you see us. In Jesus' name, amen.